Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to another edition of the b &H Virtual Event Space. We're talking intro to photography, part four, lighting, perhaps the most important part of photography itself, with a man who needs no introduction, but we'll do it anyway because we love him. Tony Gale, welcome back. How you doing, buddy? I'm well. How are you? Doing absolutely wonderful, enjoying this beautiful 30 degree breeze we've got going on in Brooklyn. How, how, how do you feel about it? You know, I like it when it's a little chilly. I'm okay. I'm okay with that. I like a little chill. Maybe, maybe if we could bump up to the fifties, maybe fifties during the day, you know, high thirties at night, that would be fine. You know what, Tony? I'll, I'll concur. I'll, I'll accept that. <laughs> it's a great answer. Uh, Thank you for joining us, everybody. I want to give a huge thanks to our host of this event, Sony. So thank you very much to them for bringing us Tony and so many wonderful events. If you do have any questions and you want to get them over to Tony, please feel free to do so. If you're joining us here on Zoom, you can use the Q&A tab. Otherwise, if you're joining us on Vimeo or Facebook, you can use the comment section. But I know Tony's already prefaced and told me he's got a ton of stuff to get through. So I'm going to get out of the way and turn it over to Tony and just say thanks again for being here. Thank you. All right. Hi, everybody. I am Tony Gale. I'm a Sony artisan of imagery. I'm a New York-based commercial photographer. Um, and as Scott said, I'm going to be going over part four of our four-part series on the basics of photography, lighting, thanks to the B&H event space, thanks to Sony, of course. Without Sony, I wouldn't be here. Uh, also, just in case it comes up, I'm a man photo ambassador in X-Rite, Colorado. I was the APA national president. And I put the wrong slide in, but I'm also a BenQ ambassador. Um, a couple of things I want to talk about before we get into it, just because I think they're cool that Sony does. Uh, if you're not aware, Sony has a Sony Alpha Female Facebook page. You do not have to identify as female to be a part of it. Um, and it is a great, it's a great community. Um, you just have to be nice. If you're not nice, they will kick you out. Be nice. Be nice anyway. Whether or not you're, you have the threat of being kicked out. Um, but part of what's cool that they do on the Sony Alpha Female Facebook page is every week they're doing a $500 micro grant based on different topics. Um, so you can enter your work. You do not have to identify as female to enter um, and you could win $500. Um, Sony also recently launched their community forums. You can get to those on alphauniverse.com if you go to community and then community forums um, or community.alphauniverse.com. Uh, it's a good way to ask a bunch of questions, interact with people, all that fun stuff. Um, and again, in an environment where people are nicer than sometimes they are when I see questions asked on Facebook. Um, and the last little quick thing, for those of you who didn't hear, Sony Alpha 7R5 was announced uh, a couple of weeks ago and it looks awesome and my pre-order is in so if it's something that interests you give it a look 8k video um it can do focus stacking the first sony mirrorless camera to do focus stacking uh fully articulating tilt and swivel screen all sorts of cool stuff all right i mentioned this on every presentation i do we are in an exciting time to be photographers. I just talked about the Alpha 7 R5. There are so many incredible tools that are available to us that just didn't exist in the past. And we are able to do things and create work that would have been very, very difficult or impossible even 10 years ago, let it go 20 years ago or in the 90s when I started. It's absolutely an incredible time to be a photographer. and even things like lighting, the tools we have for lighting are amazing. When I started, the first strobes I owned were old. They were very old at the time, but photogenic flash masters. There were little plugs to change the power. It could do 400 watts in one, where I'd pull that plug and put in a different plug, and it could do 100 watts in each of four. The heads couldn't take modifiers. Um, you know, there were big Norman packs, big, big Speedertron packs. And now what we have, we have LEDs. That's what's lighting me right now. We have, that are just incredible, lightweight and powerful. We have battery powered strobes. We just have an amazing amount of things available to us. And we should enjoy that. We should take advantage of that. We should appreciate that. 
All right. So as Scott said, understanding lighting is one of the most important things to improve your photography. A good picture is hard to do if the light is bad. It, it happens, especially with photojournalism, you know, where the subject matters more than anything. But lighting is a way to elevate your photography. And photography is literally drawing with light. That's what photography means. So lighting is a big topic. I taught lighting at Parsons for four years and I taught at FIT. And, you know, that was 15 weeks of an hour and a half each or a three hour class each week. I'd spend about an hour discussing and then two hours of people doing it for two semesters. And that still only scratches the surface. So while we're going to take this time and talk about lighting, we're only really scratching the surface because it's such a deep topic. But I did want to mention one of the things that I think is a way that you can really work on improving your lighting is to take notes. So make lighting diagrams. You can, there are websites you can use. I have the client scratched out on the top. Um, there's websites, there's lightingdiagram.com and lightingdiagrams.com. Um, you can just use a notebook. And if you diagram what you're doing, what light were you using, what modifier, what was the distances, what camera, what lens, what ISO, um, all of that information, it allows you in the future to look back and look at a picture you did and say, you know what, that worked. I'd like to do it again and change it, or that didn't work. Or if you shoot for clients, I'm shooting for somebody this week and in a month I'm shooting for them again and I need to make sure it looks the same. And sure, especially with experience, you can look at a picture and get pretty darn close, just trial and error and understanding how lighting works. But you're going to get there a lot faster if you have notes. So I would encourage you to get a notebook. And anytime you're doing anything where you have some control of the lighting, just do a little lighting diagram. It takes a couple of minutes. Uh, I always had my students had to do one for every assignment. And if you're using, this is both with strobes, if you're using daylight, I would include the time of day, I would include the date, I would include the direction of the sun. Anything that would help you in a year, go and make that picture again, write it down. All right, so light can do a lot. I did this yesterday, this is a little car uh, I bought in Cuba on our coffee table. Camera didn't move. The camera settings didn't move. So you can see, for example, it's brighter and darker. And then some more. So what this is, just to give you an idea of how you can quickly change things, and I'm sure you all understand that things can change with light. I mean, that's why we're here, right? And I also know that different people disagree with everything with photography. So somebody's going to think something I said is stupid, and that's fine. Maybe it is. You never know. Um, but it's subjective. So take what works for you. If it doesn't work for you, ignore that part. Um, just try and learn. So upper left, just window light. Middle top was a window light plus a white reflector. And we'll talk a little bit more about all this stuff in a little bit. Upper right, window light plus a silver reflector. And you can see you know, with just the window light, the shadow side of the car is quite dark. Adding a white reflector got much brighter, a silver reflector much brighter still. Window light plus the room lights on, it's brighter. It's also warmer because the room lights are warmer than the window light. Room light alone, uh, my little Lycos bicolor LED at 100%, way brighter than the window light. You know, talking about how great the lighting we have available to us is the LEDs are so much brighter. And because we're using, if we're using a mirrorless camera, like the Sony mirrorless cameras, this was the Alpha One, you can look through the viewfinder or at the screen and see exactly what you're going to get. That's something that when I started with photography, with a film camera or with the DSLR, you can't look and see what you're going to get. You can see through the viewfinder and uh, off the mirror and you can see something, but you don't know how the camera's going to interpret that. With a mirrorless camera, you do. So I kept the LED at 100% just to demonstrate, but in there, but looking through, I could instantly see it was going to be overexposed. LED at 17%. And how did I figure out it was at 17%? Because I just looked at the screen and changed the dial until it looked right. Um, then just moving the LED around, you can see, moving it to the left, around, moving it around different directions. Like 
the car looks dramatically different. Adding a LED and a silver reflector. So if you look on the bottom, you can see that the hood has that highlight on it, helping separate it from the background. And you can see also that the surface has gotten darker and that's me just moving the LED down so that it's not hitting the surface directly. And then I just put two bottles for those last two uh, on the counter so that they were blocking some of the light to add some drama. And this was the one I liked the best. The two bottles blocking some of the light, LED down, silver reflector, give a little highlight edge to the hood and to the top of the car. Um, I'm not showing you that because I think those are the most amazing photos ever, but just to give you an idea of what we can do with light. So I'm going to be talking about quantity of light, quality of light, color of light, types of lighting, and controlling light. Quantity of light is the amount of light. So how bright is it? That can sometimes be controlled. Uh, you might be able to control it by just adding more lights, turning up the power of the light, um, putting something in front of the light to knock it down. If it's the sun, the sun is however bright the sun is. You can't make the sun brighter or darker, but you can put something between your subject and the sun to make it brighter or darker. Uh, then we have quality of light. Quality of light is essentially, is it hard light or is it soft light? So direct sunlight, hard light. Hard light with shade. You can see the shadows from the trees. Different forests on a cloudy day. Now it's soft light. So direct sunlight, hard light. Cloudy day, soft light. Right before sunrise, soft light. After sunrise, hard light. So that's quality of light. When someone says quantity of light, they mean how much light is there? Essentially how bright or how dark is it? Quality of light is roughly, is it soft light, is it hard light? It gets into a lot of things, but quality of light doesn't mean good light or bad light. It means what does the light look like? We also have color of light. So it could be warm, it could be cool, it could be green, it could be magenta. Those are the standard shifts. It can be anything. So, for example, this is in a hotel room in California. Uh, warm LED light, very warm. Uh, I just added a blue gel, and now it's more neutral. So you can control the color of the light by putting things in front of it uh, to, to affect it. Um, you can change your white balance, but what's important with all of this, and I know I'm covering a lot and I'm going to go fast and we're not going to dive deep on anything because we'll run out of time, but the important thing is to be aware that light has different colors and different light sources have different colors. So this picture in Cuba, we've got the sodium vapor, very yellow. We've got that greenish fluorescent. We've got the more neutral tungsten on the, on the right. We've got the neon, lots of different colors. Sometimes that's cool, sometimes it's not. But if you're aware of it, then you can take steps to deal with it. You know, we've got the different colors at the blue hour in Luxembourg City. Warm lights, cool lights, green lights, white lights. We also have things like, you know, sunset, which can look beautiful, which you definitely want the color on. You can add colors with lights. So this is just some blue lights and some red lights. Uh, just some blue lights or adding color to the background, a blue light on a blue background to get more blue. So the point of that is just think about the color of light, not that anything in particular is right or wrong. Although I will say in general, if you're going to do a heavy color shift, uh, don't do just one color, either do multiple colors or have part of it be neutral and part of it be a color. It usually looks better. All right, then we're going to get into, let's talk about types of lighting. So there's natural light. Some of this terminology, different people disagree. Um, to me, natural light is essentially the sun or the moon, which is the sun bouncing off the moon. It's naturally occurring light that isn't, or, you know, it's not artificial. It doesn't require electricity. So with natural light, you are limited in how much control you have. Like you can put something in front of it, for example, but you can't usually change the direction of it. So you want to think about what it's doing. So this, my friend Hunter here, my friend Kayla's son, cloudy open shade. So 
you can see it's a little shadowy, but okay. If you move somebody under an overhang, if it's too bright, the light can be a little softer. Window light from the side, window light from the side front. So here, I think that's too contrasty, right? It's coming too much from the side. Just simply moving your subject back so that the light is coming from the front and the side, better lighting. Window light directly in front, direct sun. I think we all know direct sun is rarely the right answer. Uh, sometimes it is, uh, but rarely. There's a Herb Ritz photo of uh, Clint Eastwood that's amazing in direct sun. But for most people, it's not great. Direct sun from the side, still not great. Direct sun backlit. I find that if I'm in direct sun and I have no other choice, using backlighting is almost always what gives me the most uh, satisfactory results, what I'm the most happy with, because it's not doing weird shadows on my subject. So here, Hunter is backlit. Yeah, his hair is a little bit blown out and his shoulders are a little blown out, but his face looks pretty good. Um, this is direct sun, but he's under an overhang. This is in uh, Los Angeles at the old zoo. So he's just out of the sun. So you get all this nice soft light from the front, but nothing from the top. So it's a little more flattering. It's not raccoony. Um, but that exact same spot, same lighting with me moving to the side. So here the light's coming from directly behind the camera. Now it's coming from the side. You can see it's shaping a lot more. It's a very different thing. And then moving to the other side, he's in a slightly different spot, but you get the idea. So once your subject or your thing is in light that looks pretty good, consider your angle. Move around. Look to the left. Look to the right. You know, last time we talked about composition and thinking about your background and all of that is important. And this is where it gets a little tricky is in some situations, the background in its relationship to your subject is paramount. And so you just have to live with the lights that's, that's there if you can't modify it. Uh, but there are other times when maybe you just shift your subject a little bit, whether it's a person or a thing or the angle on the building or whatever it is, just shift that angle a little bit and all of a sudden you have better light. Uh, indirect sun right behind, same thing, just same spot. It's black because it's a garage. Now we're looking at the side of it and it shapes more. Which one you like better, that's subjective. There's no right or wrong there, but just think about that angle. So you're gonna use natural light. It's one of the things we many people start with. I find that a lot of people early in photography, a lot of my students in the past um, like to say they're natural light shooters. I only shoot with natural light. And that's great. Natural light can be beautiful, uh, but it's not always beautiful. So in a situation where you can, think about controlling it. So here I am. I know there's a lot of pictures of me. It's because I'll sit there and do these boring setups. These aren't exciting things to photograph. They're useful tools to demonstrate things. <clears throat> but it's hard to convince a model that they should waste their time doing that. So I sit there and do it. So here I am, window shades open, main light on the right. The lights in the room are on, but they're doing so little compared to how bright that sun is that you don't really see them. That gives you a sense. There's the window. Windows are, all the lights are still on. Window shades are open still, but the shears, the, the translucent blinds are now closed and the lights a little bit better, right? When you compare this to this. Uh, and then bringing up the shadows. So there's the shears. Same thing, window shades half closed, shears open, or rather shears closed. Or no, shears open, sorry. But by half closing them, uh, I've stopped the direct light from hitting my face and it's now coming around from the front. So it's shaping better and it's it's more flattering. Shears closed, same thing. So it's a little softer. Uh, window shades mostly closed and shears closed. It's getting darker. You can see there's a little more contrast. 
you know, directly in the sun, everything open, shears closed. This is where something like shears gets tricky. Shears often have a pattern. Like you can see either the ripples, the folds, uh, or they may have a pattern. And so you can see that pattern on my face. When it was coming in from the side, it was less visible, but directly from the front, it often is. So beware of that. Um, whether you like it or not is fine, uh, but everything should be a choice. It should be intentional. Uh, shears open, windows mostly closed, and then shades almost completely closed and the shears open. Now, this is actually the one I like the best. I like this picture. It looks like I'm the villain in a movie poster. Um, all of that, all of those different things, same 10 square feet of space, opening blinds, closing blinds, opening shears, closing shears, and moving the subject. There's a huge amount of control you have by doing relatively minor changes. And I encourage you to experiment with those. There's the blinds. So similar thing in our living room, shears open, shears closed. Which one's better? Not just because I'm smiling, but the light is much better here. And normally I would crop out the blinds on the left, but I left them in so you could get a sense of it. Uh, indirect, a little backlight, you could see the light on her head. Indirect, downtown, same thing, front light, side light, backlit, backlit, window light from the side with the ambient. Direct sunlight, direct sunlight like this can be great if it's the right time of day. There's a rule of thumb that is only a rule of thumb and definitely not an actual rule, which is if the shadow cast by your subject is longer than the subject is tall, then direct light can be good. And if it's shorter than your subject is tall, direct light, not so good. Uh, what it essentially means is early in the day, late in the day, the light is better because it's not so much overhead. It's coming more from the side just after sunrise, right? Like, I really like this photo of my friend, David. This, this Scott, this is who we were talking about, actually a really good photographer. Window light, window light, window light, window light. This I put in there because I wanted to mention that while I said natural light is sunlight, again, natural light is also moonlight or starlight. Moonlight is the light of the sun bouncing off this, the moon. So something like this, where you're getting light because the moon is just over the horizon and it's filling in, still natural light, still can be great. So natural light can be great. It's not always great. Um, if it solves your problem, if it creates the picture you want, that's fantastic. Uh, but experiment and see if you can make it even better because every photo ever made, I firmly believe can be better. Every photo I've ever made could be better. And frequently, when I'm heading home after a shoot, I'll think of the ways that I could have made it better. Hopefully, the next time I do. So now we're going to talk about available light, which in film, in motion pictures, they call practical light, uh, which is, to me, using the light in the room or the space is available light. Whatever room exists that is there. So here we are in this hotel room. I have the LED set up, but I'm not using those as an example right now. Um, this is practical light or available light, right? It's different than natural light, which is also available, but it's artificial light that exists that hopefully you can turn on and off, but you are limited in how you can control it. Maybe you can move it, maybe you can't. It's not designed for photography. So here we are, all the room lights on, not great. All the room lights on in the hallway off, still not great. Very backlit, not great. It's starting to get a little bit better. The floor lamp behind, it looks like I'm glowing. It's a, it's a little crazy, probably not the best answer. Hallway only, now it's starting to get interesting. It's very dim because it's the hallway and it's far away and it's a small, relatively small light source. Um, but because it's indirect, it's becoming a little more interesting. The overheads to the right of the camera on only, little not so great. Single overhead near the camera also starting to get interesting because 
the angle that it is hitting me at is a more interesting angle to me. It's not directly overhead. It's coming from the side. And then there's a TV. I turn that on because I think TVs can be cool light sources. And then just boosting that. Um, so there I was in the same position. I didn't move, but the light sources turned on and off. So that's one option to control uh, available light or practical light is what can you turn on? What can you turn off? Uh, I've certainly been in situations on shoots, commercial shoots, where I've had to unscrew lights to turn them off or find circuit breakers to turn them off because either using the light switch turned off too many things or not what I wanted or there was no light switch. Uh, so the other thing is the position of your subject relative to the light. So here I am basically direct under a directly under a light source. You can see the raccoon eyes and this is just moving back. So all I did is move closer to the door. All of a sudden the light is lighting my face better. Here I am sitting next to this floor lamp. The light's coming from the side and on the back. That looks terrible. Moving back a little bit better moving back more and changing my angle a little. Now it's better still. It's wrapping around a little bit better and then turning more so that uh, my face in relation to the light is lit better, even better still. Similar thing, just moving a little bit. Moving a little bit. So if you can't move your lights, move your subject. If you can't move either one, change your angle. There's always a way to make it better. Uh, and it's rarely going to be the first thing you see. So here, this is in the subway a couple of years ago, uh, downtown. I have that row of fluorescent lights on the left up high. So I have my subject on the opposite wall. So the lights are coming in from the side and it's a more flattering angle. Same subway platform. Because there's fluorescence, there's multiple banks of fluorescence, it's lighting it more evenly. This is using a uh, giant ad on the subway, those big glowing ads, Actually, really great light sources. The ones that change, it can be tricky because you get it perfect and then it changes, but it'll come back. Using that as a nice light soft, nice soft light source. Using these fluorescent tubes as a light source. Ah, uh, the B and H event space a few years ago. I hope we get to go back in there soon in person. Um, sometimes available light is light that someone can control, but not you. So in the event space, they have all these lights that are on. Um, I can't control those if I'm photographing an event, but other people can. So for my intent, all intents and purposes for me, it's just available light. It's not light I can control, even though someone else could. Uh, in a factory, Sony event a couple of years ago. There's also things where, like this was a self-portrait during COVID, a refrigerator, so all the light on me is from the fridge, available light. But I control where I put the camera and where I was. All right, we're covering a lot. So natural light, available light. And we're going to talk about constant light. So constant light for our purposes today, and again, different people may disagree on the terminology, is our light sources that are not flash. So it's a light source, typically, but not always designed for photography or video, that is on all the time that you use to create a picture. So there's small incandescent lights, little fresnels, little things like that. Um, they, they are great because they're relatively inexpensive. Incandescent lights typically are among the least expensive lights. Um, they tend to get hot and they tend to use a lot of power, uh, but they're quite inexpensive. I started uh, before somebody gave me that photogenic flash master I mentioned with the silver discs that you get at hardware stores and just a regular light bulb. Um, now, there are things available quite inexpensively that can get you started. Uh, and you don't have to go to a hardware store to buy that. You can go to B&H and buy a little uh, incandescent light 
for, I bet there's stuff for 50 bucks um, just to get started. So incandescent light, it's warm, it's inexpensive, it does get hot, it uses a lot of power, and it's not as bright as a strobe or an LED. And you have things like small LEDs. That's what's lighting me right now, although indirect. Uh, one of the great things about LEDs is some of them can change color. So the one I have that's on me right now can be warm or cool. I also have ones uh, that can do like a Luxly that can change to almost any color you can think of. It's got an RGB thing. It can be warm. It can be cool. It can be blue. It can be red. It can be green. It can be purple. It can be orange. Anything you want. So you can do something like this where you have a light with a strong color cast and then a more neutral light. The advantage of LEDs is uh, lots of control. They tend to be dimmable, whereas incandescents are not always dimmable. And incandescents, when you dim them, tend to get warmer. Uh, so it, LED is dimmable. They use less power. Some of them are battery powered. Um, they're very portable. They don't get hot. You do want to be careful, especially with inexpensive LEDs. Sometimes the color is not great. Sometimes they flicker. So especially if you're going to use silent shutter with your camera, make sure you have an LED that doesn't flicker uh, where you get banding when you take pictures or video. Um, the good ones shouldn't, but it's always worth checking. And you want to make sure that the color is consistent and accurate from one to another. For example, the first LEDs I bought were little tiny uh, square LEDs. I had five because they were cheap. And every all five of them, even though they were the same brand, were a slightly different color. So some were warmer, some were cooler. If you used just one, it didn't really matter so much. If you used more than one, you could see it. So beware of that. Uh, but LEDs, a great tool. It's a great place to start. And then there are tons of other constant light sources. So this is a larger LED. Uh, this is just using a standard incandescent bulb, LED bulb. There's HMIs, there's fluorescence, there's things like Kino flows. There's a ton of constant source lights out there. Use with whatever you like, um, but just experiment and see what makes sense. I mostly, it's LEDs if I'm using constant light now. I do have some incandescents, um, but generally the power and uh, uh, lack of heat on an LED is, is a good answer. Then we have speed lights or flash. So one of the first things I recommend for someone who wants to start with lighting um, is to get a flash, start with a flash. So I use the Sony flashes. I like them a lot. Uh, there's currently five. If you're looking at a flash, uh, I would really encourage you to get one that has a radio built in so that you can use more than one wirelessly. So you can see with Sony, for example, uh, in their naming, if it says RM, that's radio, R is radio. So the 60RM2, radio, 32M, not a radio, 28RM, yes, radio, 46RM, yes, radio, 20M, not a radio. So the, the other two can be used wirelessly, but it uses an optical thing that's not as good. Um, if you're going to get a, a flash or a speed light, I really, really, really would encourage you to get something with a radio. Uh, you still need a transmitter or another one to control it, but uh, once you have that, it, it's just going to open up a whole world of opportunities for you. Um, if you have existing Sony flashes, the M's, not the RM's, there is a radio commander, and I use the radio commander with the RM's all the time. There's also a receiver you can get to put your older Sony flashes uh, on, and then it has a wireless radio receiver. So if you have a bunch of flashes already and you don't want to buy new ones, there is an opportunity, an option for you. So speed lights. The standard thing people do with speed lights, put it on the camera, point it at your subject, boom. Shooting events, that makes sense. It's often the best way to go, but you can start doing a lot more things. So this is three speed lights. Um, there's one down the stairs going up, and then there's two on the front, one on the left, one on the right. 
Uh, the two on the front have a little one inch square softbox on them to soften the light a little bit. And you can start shaping the light and controlling the light by using multiple speed lights off camera. The advantage speed lights have is that they are very, very light. Uh, they're moderately inexpensive. There are cheaper, bigger strobes. Um, I do think a lot of the cheap strobes you want to be cautious about. Um, make sure you read the reviews. Make sure you feel good about it. Um, as I've said before, I was told very early on in my photography journey to buy the best equipment I could afford. And I, I definitely believe that because I have bought plenty of things because I wanted to spend less money and then regret it. Um, that said, if you're going to use it once or, you know, everybody has to make their own decision. Everybody, uh, what's right for everyone is not the same. So three speed lights here, two speed lights here. One speed light with an umbrella here on the right. Two speed lights here. Um, one advantage that speed lights have is that the flash duration, which is the amount of time that the flash is actually firing, uh, is very, very short. So they're really good for freezing motion. Um, bigger strobes can be, uh, but they don't tend to have the, the speed that a speed light does. Speed light doesn't have the power that a bigger strobe has, so everything's a trade-off. Uh, but for something like this, speed lights can be great. Really freezing everything. All right. Then we have strobes or flash. So those are the big guns. It's the kind of lighting I use the most. And it tends to be the lighting that intimidates people the most um, because it's not something you can see. When you're using an LED or an incandescent or the sun or the room light, you turn it on, you can see that it's on, you can see what it's doing. If you move it, you can see it, it change on your subject. All of that is something that we can see and understand visually. With a strobe or a speed light or a flash, that's not the case because it's going to flash and we can't see what that's going to do. Now, typically a bigger strobe or flash is going to have a modeling light, which is there in part to give you a sense of what the light's going to do. Um, but it's never 100%. So with the bigger strobes or flash, um, there's battery powered or AC powered. More and more of what's available is battery powered. Most of what I use is battery powered, um, but they're quite powerful, 500 watts, uh, some of them even more. Uh, much, much more powerful than a speed light. And a flash of any kind is much, much more powerful than an uh, LED or an incandescent. Um, but battery power, you don't have to worry about plugging into a wall. Uh, there's no cords. It's really great. The disadvantage, of course, is you have to have batteries. So if you use up the batteries and you don't have extra batteries charged, you're done taking pictures. AC powered, so wall current powered, they plug into a wall or a generator or whatever, uh, they tend to recycle faster. So you can shoot more quickly with AC powered strobes. Um, they're less likely to overheat in general, in my experience. Overheating strobes is not something that most people have an issue with. Uh, I shoot very, very, very quickly um, and have overheated almost every light I've ever owned. And I get good lights and I, I can, I'm still very capable of overheating them. So there's battery powered, there's AC powered. With AC powered in particular, it used to be this way with battery powered, but less so. There's also monolights, which are a big light. Everything's in one or a pack and heads where you've got a box that you plug the lights into. Uh, so strobe, because of its power and its versatility, again, is, is what I use the most. So here we are outside, battery powered strobe, 500 watts. Photographing a hunter on the swing, uh, freezing the motion because it's strobe. If this was an LED or an incandescent, to get the shutter speed high enough to stop the motion, I would have to really crank up the ISO. With the strobe, I don't have to do that. I'm also able to balance the blue sky and the strobe because the strobe is so much more powerful. 
if I was using a constant source light, I would need a lot of light to get that much power, a lot. So we're in full shade here. You can see this is what it's like with no strobe, with strobe. That's the power of a strobe is it's able to do things that you just can't really do with a constant light. But you can't see what it's doing until you take the picture. Strobes are great in studios. Um, they tend to, when people are sensitive to light, which is often the case, I mean, admittedly, sometimes people get sensitive to the flash going boom, 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 boom. But if you put really bright lights near someone's eye line, sometimes they squint, sometimes their eyes start watering. It can be challenging for people. Uh, that's less often the case with a strobe. If you want something like this, super clean white background, strobe's the way to go. All right. So we've talked about what kinds of lights are available. And of course, there's always something that we miss, but we can only cover so much. Now we're going to talk about controlling the light. So I mentioned at the beginning about reflectors. I think the very first thing that anybody should buy in terms of controlling light and understanding light is a reflector. So I like the, the, Manfrotto tri-grip and tri-flip. I also like the Manfrotto halo. So there's things that are all in one. There's things that are frames that you put stuff on. There's also, if you just go to B and H and click on lighting and it and uh, modifiers, there's a lot of stuff. There's soft boxes, there's octoboxes, umbrellas, reflectors, barn doors, snoots, grids, gels, gobos, lenses, cookies, scrims, <laughs> reflectors, light control and accessory kits really just seems like it's other things combined. There's a lot of stuff out there. First thing, get a reflector. Second thing, get an umbrella once you have an artificial light of some kind. So why, why use all this to control your light? So we talked about how some of that's limited if you're using available light or natural light. If you're using lights you can control, you can typically modify them. So Here's this lovely shell, overhead room lights only. Direct flash, not great. Bouncing the flash onto the ceiling, more interesting, right? Uh, now the flash is off camera with a white reflector to fill. So we've, we're getting some dimension to it, but it's also, we're getting the fill. Flash off camera with an umbrella bounced. So an umbrella, nice, soft light source, helps give it some direction. Uh, a smaller, the EasyBox Speedlight 2, which is a little one inch, one foot square-ish softbox. Uh, moving it further away, when you move a light source further from your subject, it gets harder. So we talked about how the sun is a hard light source, even though it is enormous, right? Many, 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 many times larger than the earth. Because it's 93 million miles away, it becomes small relative to our subject. So it's a hard light source. When the clouds are out, it diffuses the light. It becomes a big light source. If you have anything, any light source, and it's close, it's softer than if it moves further away. On the other hand, if you have it closer, it does become softer, but you get something called the inverse square law coming into play. What that is, is the fall off of light, how quickly it goes from bright to dark, changes when the light's position relative to your subject changes. So as you move a light source closer to your subject, the light falls off more quickly. So if you look here, it's the same light source further away, closer away. Now the background is darker. The contrast on the shell is greater. Because the light is closer to our subject, uh, it falls off more quickly on the background. It's a great tool if you're in a situation where you don't like your background, you want it darker. If you can move your light closer, that will help. Uh, this is a small, the Luxley Viola, uh, a small LED. Just moving it around inside with a fill, silver fill, backlighting, which can be very cool, edge lighting, 
and moving it closer. Same thing before, same with the speed light, the Sony speed light, you move it in closer, uh, the background got darker. Same thing with the LED, moving it in closer. Now the background's very dark because of the inverse square law and the fall off becomes more quick. Uh, and again, something that if you're using a mirrorless camera, Sony mirrorless camera, this was the R4, um, you can see exactly what's gonna happen when you're using a constant source like this LED. Speed light, take the picture and see. But again, that's something we can do with digital. With film, you take the picture to see that involved taking a picture, dropping off your roll of film, waiting for it to get processed, looking at it, deciding that you did everything wrong and you have to redo it and doing that again, or getting a camera with a Polaroid back and spending you know a dollar a sheet or two dollars a sheet on Polaroid and waiting 90 seconds between. Whereas now, click, do we like it? No, what can we change? Click, it's better, but not good enough. Click, it's getting there. We can very quickly learn and adapt. It's a great way for everybody to get, just improve their work. All right. And then to just quickly go over a couple other things. One of the most common things people wanna do is balance strobes with available light or natural light. So here, for example, balancing indoor light and outdoor light. If, you, if I take a picture of a person in front of a window with no lights on, on, with no strobe on the inside, no lights on, it's just a silhouette, right? The outside is more or less properly exposed. The interior room lights are on, but the sun is bright. The sun is much brighter uh, than any room light. So if I add a strobe with some umbrella, now I can control that. R4, 51.2 GM, 250th of second, F5, ISO 100. Same thing, balancing it out. So one of the tricks, if you're gonna do that, it's not just as simple as putting up a strobe with constant lights, um, is you have to understand how the exposure works. So the F-stop on your exposure, affects both the strobe and the constant light, if it's the sun or room lights or whatever. Your shutter speed only affects the constant light. High-speed sync is a little bit of an exception because the power of the strobe changes. But um, So for example, here we are, 250th of a second, 7.1 ISO 100. 250th of a second, 3.5 ISO 100. Darker, brighter, right? We all see that. 250 of a second F5 ISO 100, 125th of a second F5 ISO 100. Backgrounds darker, backgrounds brighter. I basically look the same. Because changing the shutter speed made the background brighter by one stop because it's letting in more of that light, but it's not impacting the strobe exposure at all because that is controlled by the flash duration, which is much faster than the shutter speed making the background brighter still, brighter still, and still I'm basically the same, right? My skin tone more or less the same, even though the shutter speed changed dramatically. All right, we covered a lot. Um, Just a little bit. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> if anybody's heads aren't spinning, um, let's see if there are any questions. Definitely. Well, first and foremost, thank you. That was a ton of information. And I know we kind of crammed it into a really short amount of time. So I mean, that could have been know, four things right there. But <laughs> in case you're unaware, you can always rewatch this stuff. You can always rewatch Tony or myself. I know nobody's rewatching me, but Tony, at least um, you can go to Vimeo.com slash BH event space, or you can check us out on Facebook BH event space, and you can rewatch anything that we stream. Obviously it won't be live, but you can rewatch it. You can pause it. You can come back to it, digest it. So ton of great information. And I always suggest doing that. At least if you're like me, sometimes things take a little bit longer to just seep in. So you can always just fast forward to the part you care about too. You don't have to watch the whole thing. Exactly. Exactly. You don't have to, if you want to, you can, but if not, you can just kind of scroll throughout, break it into clips. Uh, so we'll dive into the questions here. Uh, Glenn's asking typically for a two light on location headshot inside with little to no natural window light with a key light and a fill. 
do you have any recommendations for umbrella versus softbox for the key and for fill perhaps reflector saving the second strobe for rim light there's a lot Tony. sorry <laughs> saving second strobe for rim lighting or lighting up the backdrop thank you for all the examples and for your time so if i only have two lights for an interior headshot um i typically will use a softbox or a five foot octa as the main light and i will use an umbrella on the second strobe as a fill um if I only have two lights, I'm more likely to try and control the amount of light on the background by moving the background relative to my subject, like closer, more light, further away, less light. Um, if I have a reflector or if there's a white wall, sometimes you can use the white wall as a fill and then use that second light for the background or as a room light. Um, but for a lot of clients, even though I like the single light, no fill look, uh, it can be a little too contrasty for what a lot of people want. Um, so I'm more likely to use one light as a fill and one light as a main than to use one light as a main and then the second light for my background or as a rim light. But every situation is different. Like there's no, no two shoots are the same. Great. Now, maybe you can dive into this. Oh, Glenn said, thank you very much. That was a big help. So Thank you, Glenn. Okay. I'm glad to hear around. it. Appreciate it. Um, you mentioned with Sony, you mentioned the R is for radio. Can you Oh, well, dive... R is for radio on the flashes, not on the cameras, but yes. Right, right. Sorry, sorry. I should have been specific about that in, in regard to the flashes, yes. Can you dive into that a little bit and explain for people at home what radio means in regards sure. to a flash? So what it means... So. First, just to, be, to show how nerdy I am, the Sony flashes all start with HBL, which is hybrid video light, and then F for flash, and then a number, which is the guide number. The guide number is a way of telling you how powerful the light is, um, although different manufacturers do it in different ways, so you can't really compare brand to brand, but only within a brand. So the 60 is the most powerful Sony flash. Um, then R's radio, M is for multi-interface shoe. So what the radio is, is a way to control communication between multiple flashes or the camera and multiple flashes to have everything fire at once, change the power. So there's a light on the left. I want it brighter. I can change that. Light on the right. I want it darker. I can change it. Light on the background. I want that brighter. I can change that. That's all done via radio signal. So they all communicate with one another via radio. You do need something on the camera to control that, which can be a flash or it can be the controller. Does that answer this, that question? I think so. I, I get it because I, 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 I equate it to sort of like remote controls with a television. Yeah, that's what it is. So think yeah. about it. If you, have, if you have a regular remote control with infrared, that's got to have line of sight with whatever device you're trying to control. Otherwise, radio frequency is the radio waves yeah greater range than infrared um and doesn't have to be line of sight exactly you can basically be behind a wall as long as you're within range of distance. right within reason it can't be five thousand feet away yes unless unless you invent that tomorrow then then we'll, well have another conversation th there is ways you can get uh certain radio triggers like pocket wizards you can use them to relay and then you could put like 10 of them to relay in that distance. There you go. You now now you're talking on like on a on a crazy like like Celeria, Celerina kind of radio frequency stuff. He used to do all that crazy stuff, I remember. Um so you kind of mentioned this and you kind of touched on it, but we did get a question here about it. When purchasing a speed light, how do you determine which speed light is going to give you more power? So a higher guide number. Um we we did mention that. So the trick with the guide number is that, like I mentioned, different brands measure it in different ways. Some of them use feet, some of them use meters. Um, within a brand, a higher guide number should always be more powerful than a lower guide number. So the, the 28M is less powerful than the 60RM2. Beautiful. Well, Tony, 
that was wonderful. I think that wraps up our four part series, right? It does. It does. So if you, if you missed any of the prior ones, again, I'm just going to reiterate, you can rewatch them. They're on the Vimeo channel or the Facebook, whichever you prefer, but there's a ton of great information as always that Tony provides for us. So want to say thank you very much to him. Are, are we going to see you anytime soon? Well, now I have to come up with what ideas I have next and I haven't done that yet. So hopefully okay. I just have to come up with some ideas. If anybody so has you. something they want to hear me talk about, just let me know. There you go. If, if you got an idea that you want to hear Tony talk about, shoot us an email. Uh, I was going to say Vimeo. See, I'm, I'm so obsessed with Vimeo lately. No, uh, <laughs> eventspacereviews at gmail.com. That's how you can get in contact with us and let us know things like what you'd like us to talk about, whether that be with Tony or maybe somebody else. If you've got ideas, yeah. we're always open to listening. We don't, maybe, we don't, maybe you've seen down. enough of me. <laughs> There's never enough, Tony. Stop it. Come on. We love you around here. Or if you just want to, you know, directly talk with Tony, check him out, interact with him there on the social that is up on the page and drop him a uh, message. He'll although if you, it. if you do, and I don't get back to you, please reach out again. There is someone who I can't remember their name, who emailed me with a question and I couldn't get back to him right away. And now I can't find the email and I don't remember what their name is. So I can't get back to them. Um, so if you reach out to me and I don't respond, just reach out again after a couple of weeks. There you go. Well, Tony, I want to say thank you again. Obviously, I want to thank Sony as always for sponsoring this event along with the other three and many others that they do. So thank you very much to them. But alas, that's all the time we have for tonight. This has been another edition of the B&H Virtual Event Space, and we'll catch you next time. Thanks, everybody.